because I'm going to switch to my presenter view. So please let me know if you can hear me. Anyone? OK, I see yes from Pulkit, so I'm just going to start then. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm not going to add anything to that. I think that was a, a very well done introduction. Um, maybe to start with uh, what Holmes exactly is. So uh, there was already mentioned that Holmes tries to crack unstructured data. And if you look at our vision strategies that we set up with the team, uh, we basically say that we, Holmes uh, cracks unstructured data to make our bankers faster and better informed by unleashing the power of collective knowledge. Uh, what, what exactly does that mean? That's a lot of words in, the, in one sentence. Well, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, within ING and any big corporates, you, uh, or there are a lot of unstructured documents. Think of PowerPoints, think of uh, PDF documents, think of Word documents, can be any form of unstructured data, um, which are often fragmented over different document management systems, and especially in big, bigger organizations, uh, these tend to be hard to combine. Um, which immediately means that it's difficult for users to find the data if they actually know where to look for. Um, so it's very time consuming to find the information. And oftentimes, the systems that allow you to search for those type of documents only allow you to search on metadata of documents, not on document content itself. Um, if you look at Gardner, who nowadays has a magic quadrant uh, on inside engines. So what is an inside engine? Um, according to Gardner, an insight engine combines search with AI to deliver actionable insights derived from the full spectrum of content and data sources within and external to the enterprise. So simply put, um, we make data available within documents, and we try to enhance the uh, search capability by applying uh, advanced, advanced uh, algorithms and uh, AI capabilities. Going back to, uh, to our vision, that basically means that we, as Holmes, we offer a really simple basic search engine. Think of it as an internal Google um, to search for document content. And on top of that, we try to enhance the search experience and help users find new information and find information faster uh, by um, extending this with AI-driven solutions. So Holmes started um, about three years ago as a, a proof of concept. It was actually my first. Um, my first product that I started working on when I joined WBA about three years ago. And Holmes targets as an initial product, it targets two and a half thousand employees within uh, ING Wholesale Bank specifically. Um, we currently have three different document types that we're ingesting and we are currently with 250 users, uh, hoping to extend that to the full range of, uh, of users uh, within six, uh, six months. So if you think about the domain, so what are we actually exactly doing um, as a product? Um, we've split up the domain into four different um, functional blocks or four different uh, subdomains. Um, the first one would be ingestion, and ingestion has everything to do with retrieving document data plus any metadata that we might want to have into the system from any source system. Um, and if you refer back to the Gardner quote, this could be internal to ING, uh, but this could also be external to ING. So the, the target user group that we have right now um, is very much interested in, in rating reports, which are uh, external reports for, from, for example, Moody's or S&P. Um, and we're trying to also provide those within the same, same search engine or same product to uh, basically provide a, a more complete overview of all the data that could be relevant to the, to the user. Um, extraction is, mm -hmm. is the concept that we extract any relevant information. So we extract any, we, we basically change unstructured data to structured data. Um, I'll get back to that in a bit. Um, enrichments are any process or any AI-driven solution that we do on top of the extracted information. So if we have converted a document to structured information, what kind of things can we do on top of that data to provide a richer search experience? Um, and one of those, uh, which I'll get to later too, is, um, for example, classifying which sector a document belongs to, um, which can make for a really simple filter within, uh, within Holmes to. Uh, quickly get the user to specific information on specific sectors, for example. And search, uh, obviously, is all about providing this data to the user, either in, in the front end, um, but also any search capabilities on top of Elasticsearch or, or, or similar tools that we may need to simply have the user search through the content that we have, through the instruction data. So diving a little bit into extraction. Um, extraction mm -hmm. is, for us, at this moment, a three-step process. Um, so the first step is optical character recognition. 
it could be that some documents don't require this step. So if, if you're thinking about a PDF, for example, um, they can be searchable. So if you open a PDF, you can sometimes search through the content. Sometimes they're just scanned images, and you will need to use OCR to uh, to extract um, the text from the uh, from the image, basically. On top of that, we do um, if we have a process called text extraction, and text extraction is simply extracting all available text in the document. Um, so if a document doesn't require OCR, this is a very simple and very quick step to do. And on top of that, um, there's a bit more involved process, also a bit more lengthy in terms of processing time, and also a lower success rate, which is table extraction. In table extraction, we're specifically looking for um, page headers or specific tables within a document, and then looking for specific attributes in that table. Um, and this is information that is obviously very document specific, and is also uh, well, requires a lot more engineering efforts to uh, to produce per document type, basically. So if, if you think about the functional requirements for us as a product, um, I mentioned that we started out with, or we are starting out with one user base. Um, but obviously, we have the intention to scale this to a bigger audience, um, hopefully to, to the entire wholesale banking and, and hopefully beyond to the entire ING. Um, so we, we wanted to set out with a few basic rules or, or requirements that we, um, we're going to build a system around or build, uh, going to build our product around. And the first one would be that we wanted to scale to a multitude of different documents. Um, getting an estimate of how many document types that is was, was quite difficult. Also, per document type, there are different quantities. Some are, uh, yeah, for some document types, there are a lot of different documents. Some only come in maybe once or twice a day or not even. Um, so we needed to build a, we wanted to build a system which was able to, to cope with all these different, different document types and different scales per document type, basically. Um, as we are in a, a quite regulated environment as a bank, we wanted to build a system with this in mind from the get-go. So um, if you look at what we're doing, we don't want to replicate security restrictions which are in source systems. So if you have a specific document type um, which is in a specific source system that, that already has its own restrictions on which users can view which documents, um, that's not something that we want to replicate over and over again for each and every document type that we put into the system. Um, so this was a, a, yeah, a really important regulation to, uh, to take into account from the get-go. How are we going to deal with that, basically? Um, we want any change in source system to propagate to our system as soon as possible. Um, let's imagine that a document gets deleted in the source system. Well, then we obviously need to make sure that it's also deleted from our system, uh, because otherwise we would be showing false content that the user would never be able to get to. Um, or even worse, let's say that a document is um, by accident uploaded with the, the wrong security restrictions. Um, someone finds out and, and updates the security restrictions, well, then we definitely need to get the update as soon as possible. Um, we set out with the principle to get data into our search engine as soon as possible. So if you think back about the two steps that we had, text and table extraction, um, text extraction is, is within a second we, we're able to extract it. Oh, sorry. Um, table extraction sometimes can take up to a minute. Um, also, doesn't have the highest success rate. I think we're at about 70% of our main document type in terms of success rate. So we wanted to have a split between those in which we can say per document type, the minimum required set of data is either only text or maybe text and table, depending on the source type. Um, but as soon as we have the minimum required set of data, we want it to be visible to the user so that we can provide value to our users as soon as possible. And while the system in the background is, is churning on uh, the enrichments or churning on the, the table extraction, that data will become available whenever it is available. Um, we don't want to wait for everything to be available uh, before we show it to the user. That's basically the, uh, the gist. Um, and last but not least, we want our search capabilities and enrichments to, well, they are document specific, but we also want them to be or to have different SLAs. So it's, this refers back to my previous point. Um, even if we aren't able to run a specific AI model on top of document data that we were able to extract, then having the data in that system as soon as possible, so the text extraction in the system as soon as possible, is still very valuable. Um, so there are different SLAs for different components in terms of document extraction that has the highest priority. If something fails there, we, we need to be on top of that. If one of the enrichments fails for a while, it's it's less of an impact to the to the global system. Let's put it that way. And since they are document specific, um, 
well, it also was a good guideline for us to think about how we would structure the global architecture. Um, so if we look at some of the architecture techniques, it was already in the title or in the description of the, the talk today. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of the techniques that we, uh, that we are using. Um, I won't be able to give a really lengthy uh, or really detailed explanation about all of them. They're quite uh, detailed topics on its own. Um, but there is enough information on, on the internet to find. I add, I add some links in some of the slides. So if you want to know more about one of these, uh, just refer to the presentation. So one of the first that I wanted to start with is the reactive principles. And maybe some of you are already familiar with the reactive manifesto, which is uh, a document originating from 2013. Um, created by Lightband, Pivotal, Netflix, and a few other companies. And it basically addresses common problems um, faced in building modern cloud-driven applications. And on top of that, in 2020, they, the Reactive Foundation, which is a, a Linux-based foundation, um, also released the pre Reactive Principles, which basically provides guidance and techniques um, established by people that have been doing reactive programming for, for a while, since mostly since 2013. Um, and it builds on top of the manifesto uh, with practical principles and guidelines that you or your team can follow. Um, so if you think about reactive principles, there are four main principles. Um, to start with the first one, responsiveness. And responsiveness basically means that your sh system should be able to respond in a timely manner if it is possible to do so. And this should focus on providing a, a rapid and consistent response times, for example, um, but also a consistent quality of service. So you want to give your user the best user experience, obviously. Um, and yeah, especially nowadays, uh, when even business users are used to um, applications like Google or Facebook or Netflix, they, they have high demands also from business applications. If you think about resiliency, uh, resiliency has to do with responding uh, to failures. So if you have a monolith and something breaks, well, it's simply everything is down. Your entire application is down. You can't do it a lot except for fix the bug and, and get it back online. Uh, resiliency on, on one end is about isolation um, in, in the terms of isolating business functionality in different deployables, for example. Um, on the other hand, it's about replication. So um, if you have a specific component, um, replication can help with errors or failure related to one of your replicas. The other, other replicas will still be available to serve your user. Um, and it also has to do with, uh, with delegation uh, of responsibilities. So if you think about elasticity, um, elasticity has all to do with coping with varying workloads. So if you take into or look back at, the, at what I mentioned with different document types, we really were looking when we were building this for a way in which we could scale our architecture to be able to cope with varying workloads um, over specific document types or uh, parts of the system, basically, that, uh, or parts of the workload that our system does. And last but not least, it's um, mostly message-driven in the sense that there are asynchronous boundaries between different components. Um, and that most, I'll get to why that's important in a, in a bit. So, if you think about a, a big system uh, like what we're uh, what we're building here, it's it, it's it's a system built of smaller components or composed of smaller components, and these principles that are uh, found in the Reactive Manifesto and also the Reactive Foundation, they are really applied to any level of the system. So so these principles you can apply at the lowest level, but also on on the highest level. Uh, so within a specific component, but also across multiple components or your entire system, basically. If you think about the, the communication pattern, so let's say that you have uh, a set of microservices that need to communicate. The, uh, the, the simplest option, of course, is to, uh, to, to use some synchronous uh, means of communication, maybe over REST or GRCP. Um, but if you, if you break it down into what kind of communication happens in the, in the system, um, for us, a system emits events. And an event, think of an event as a fact that happens within a specific system at a specific time. So events are often um, written in past tense. Simply, they cannot be denied. It happened in a specific part of your system. Um, then what another service can do, and this is what I'm talking when I'm talking about the asynchronous boundary, this is where it, it, it really shines. A different component without knowing where a specific event came from or the other way around. A component that creates an event doesn't need to know who is interested in the data that it produces. A different component can listen to events created somewhere in the system um, and decide to do its own processing or 
its own metadata enrichment or anything it actually wants to do with those events. It's free to do whatever it wants. Um, so you can listen to events created elsewhere. Besides that, you a service or component can also listen to commands and think of a command as, as simply a demand to do something. So I want um, a specific component to ingest a document or, or run some extraction. Um, I could, as a, as a callee, emit a command to that service to ask it to do something. And last but not least, um, it can also respond to queries. Um, so since data is segregated over multiple components, you need to figure out a way to get to that data. And oftentimes you can use a, the, well, you can use a query for that. Um, with this communication, what we try to do is we try to avoid direct coupling using REST uh, HTTP calls or gRCP for events. And simply for the reason that it promotes loose coupling. So if I have one service which emits an event and at this specific time, there's only one, uh, one other service interested in knowing that, then it's quite simple to build that. You create an HTTP connection between A to B um, and you're, you're done. But what if you, at a certain point, have another consumer that's interested in the events? Are you then going back to your first service to tell it that it needs to be aware of a second component? And are you then going to duplicate the logic and effort of, of connecting those two again? Um, th this basically tends to go, well get messy really quick. Um, so especially for, for uh, events, it's quite useful to uh, use asynchronous boundary, boundaries using a queuing system like Kafka, RabbitMQ. Um, you can get away with a lot of, uh, a lot of those solutions. So looking at commands and queries, it, it, those do tend to go over REST or uh, GRCP. Um, simply because the responses are, are so specific um, to a specific consumer. And you would quickly go, get into a real overhead of maintaining, if you're, if you're using Kafka, for example, maintaining topics um, just for all the different type of, of data responses that you could, uh, could be dealing with. Um, luckily, in the system that we've built so far, we still don't have any direct HTTP communication or synchronous communication between services at all. So most of it is... Uh, is still hand or everything is still handled over uh, events, asynchronous events. Um, one good tip is if you are going to do anything uh, in terms of commands or queries with doing REST and GRCP, if you think about the reactive principles again, you want to make sure that if someone, let's say comp component A, um, sends an HTTP request to you, component B, you validate the request, you accept the request, and you basically tell it that it was accepted. You won't be processing the actual request on the fly while the, the request is waiting. You want to be able to offload the fact that you received it and unburden the caller. Um, you accepted it, you stored the fact that you're going to process this, and obviously you need to provide some way or some pattern to your consumer to be able to get the data once it's done processing. So with the domain, um, when you're building distributed systems, there are different techniques that you can use to discover how, um, how you're going to do the split, basically. Everybody has seen so many memes and so many stories about microservices and where they go wrong. Um, and it's often, for me at least, it's often the split between are you reasoning about technical microservices or are you reasoning about functional microservices? So how does your, your domain, how, how does your system relate to what the business actually is? And one really interesting technique to, um, to, to use here uh, to help you guide, you guide you into the right direction is using domain-driven design. And domain-driven design was introduced and made popular by Eric Evans um, in a book he released in 2004. Anyone with a software engineering background will most likely know this blue book because nobody can properly well, can read through it entirely and understand what he's talking about. Um, but yet, it's a very, very interesting um, architecture technique. And he basically describes it as, as the expansion upon an application of the domain concept as it applies to the development of software. So in layman's terms, again, it's a technique focused around modeling your software to what the business domain is about. Um, and this is not something that you as a team of engineers can, can do by yourself. Um, engineers often aren't domain experts. So there is a real part of, uh, the, 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 there's a, yeah, a big part of collaboration involved with domain experts, with the business to get to a system that even they can recognize. Um, and some of the benefits are that it eases communication when you're talking to stakeholders um, and because you're simply using the same language when describing uh, a certain functionality or a certain set of features. 
And it also improves flexibility if, uh, if, if applied well. So what are some of the things that you can do to discover your domain, which is the biggest thing that you will need to do when you build such a system? Um, for me, it's, it's always around business, as I mentioned. So it's um, basically you're looking to bridge the gap between the business and tech. And one of the techniques you can do is to focus on the ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous language, which is basically speak the same language as your, um, as your business does. If you refer to a specific process in your in your application um, at, with a specific term, but they don't recognize that term, then again, communication is, is much more difficult than if you can easily relate to the same concepts using the same language. Um, on top of that, there are nowadays a lot of visual collaboration techniques which you can apply. Uh, you can find the link down here. There's a GitHub page which has a lot of the different visualization uh, or collaboration techniques which, uh, which we tend to use. Um, especially since uh, since we're all remote, um, it's still easily doable uh, with tools like Miro. Uh, this, this is really nice to do as a group. Um, I must admit that this that it is still well completely different from being in the same room, being able to put up stickies, for example, onto a board. Um, but with Miro, we're getting quite close to what it would normally look like. So the different techniques in these on the on github they have a different abstraction level so at a specific point um some are uh, more interesting or less interesting i see that i'm running a little bit out of time so i'm going to quickly skip over this is one of the um so the, F, the 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 techniques are an evolutionary process so it's not a linear process you're going to move between techniques depending on the needs that you of the the, the business functionality that you're um, discussing at a certain point um, one of the techniques that we used is um, event storming, which you can see an example of, of here, which we did about six months ago. So looking at this today, what does it actually look like? Um, Holmes is now built up of four different domains. And within those domains, we have different services. And those different services, they all communicate through Kafka. And um, if you zoom into some of those um, if you think of extraction, extraction was about extracting, or sorry, ingestion uh, is, is about ingesting data from an external system. And we tend to model every source system with its own component. And only that component is responsible for understanding the system and doing whatever it needs to do to get the data into our system. Here is also a really important um, point where we segregate the external domain from the internal domain. So any ID generation on the outside, it's lost, and we basically generate an ID of our own to ensure that we will never have an ID clash, because we simply can't uh, count on external systems um, to always provide unique identifiers. So extraction, as I mentioned, has an orchestrator principle. And the orchestrator is the component that, for us, determines which workflow to use per document type. So do we only want to extract text, or do we also want to extract tables, for example? Um, and the orchestrator will be responsible of creating the, the commands and making sure that those two different components, they do their job. And also providing um, or, well, taking care of the workflow of the results that come back in. So did it succeed? Did it fail? Et cetera. Um, enrichment is, as I mentioned, the AI-driven solutions that we do on top of uh, the, the, the search or the text, the, uh, the structured data. And we now have two different ones. One side, we have company recommendations. So we try to recommend similar companies based on information that we find in the text and also sector classification, as I said earlier on. And last but not least, we have our front end part, um, which consists of a component that exports all the data to Elasticsearch and a simple front end plus an API that um, is, is available to our users. So if you think about the journey that a document goes through, um, we basically either get a pull message or, or we either pull data from a source system or we get a, a message from them over a, a queue, for example. Our ingestion basically ingests the document and the data. Um, it, the orchestrator will then trigger on the event that a document was ingested. And it will determine for that document type, what are we exactly going to do? So it could be table or text or both. Um, then it will, when table extraction, for example, is done, that could be the trigger for sector classification to try to classify the sector based on um, specific fields that we get out of the out of the tables. Uh, on the other hand, the orchestrator is also interested in knowing for a specific document whether table extraction failed or succeeded. Um, same goes for for text extraction. And 
Then there's another part which needs both the data from text and table extraction to recommend a company. Um, this is, again, all event-based, so there is no direct communication. Um, so every part of the domain here shares or, or creates events that are interested, that are, well, basically about their domain, um, mm -hmm. and multiple consumers are, uh, are available to, do, uh, to listen to those. And last but not least, we have the exporter, which puts everything in Elasticsearch. So the nice thing about this is that anything here can fail um, because our user journey is only about this part. We have a front-end application. There is a search API which directly talks to Elasticsearch. So our complete processing is, is completely decoupled from the rest of the application, which is a huge benefit. Um, same goes for the company recommender. Um, API searches for a document, provides the document as soon as possible to the user. Uh, then we'll try to fetch company recommendations for that specific document. Um, either can, uh, well, company recommendation can fail without impacting the user too much. I think I'm gonna skip over some of the challenges. So maybe to start with the most important one, um, distributed communication is hard. So it's a service that doesn't need to know who's interested in data. That's good, right? Um, so it provides loose coupling or promotes loose coupling and high cohesion. Adding additional consumers doesn't impact uh, the producer of the event. Um, there are responsibilities of the caller that are no longer there. Like uh, if you do HTTP calls, you need to do a retry. If it fails, you need to have some sort of backoff mechanism. If the one that you're calling is, is having, uh, having performance issues, you may need some, some sort of circuit breakers. Um, those are all nice benefits. Um, but there are also, it also introduces new complexity. Um, so processing complexity is internal to the components instead of with an external component. But on the other hand, um, it produces in additional complexity like retrying field events. So if I'm listening to events, and there's an issue with the data in the topic, for example, or I cannot parse that event for whatever reason, I will need to understand how to deal with that. So I might need to move that message to a dead letter queue or to some other uh, means of storing it so that I can continue processing messages that I am capable to process. Um, uh, other things that you may need to think about is what if I need to get data from a, a service, how am I going to get that data? Um, so you may want to have some sort of event logs per service. The second one um, is all about the domain. So you want to separate, as I mentioned before, with the IDs, you want to separate the external from the internal. You define your own domain model and you map any external system to that domain model. Um, and when I talk about domain models, it, it can be from external to internal, but it can even be that different bounded contexts or different subdomains have a different representation of a document. Every domain in our system knows a document but they all share or they all have their own definition of what the document in their context actually means. Um, another big one to think about is if you're going to work with events, what data do you put into the events? Are you going to create really big events that have all possible data that you could think of that someone might want to have? Or are you going to trim it down to what you think is essential about a specific event? And do you need to provide a different uh, mechanism to uh, for consumers to get additional data from you if they are interested in that. And a, a last one is that you want uh, to prioritize intent over technical simplicity. So you could run into a case where you will have two events that have exactly the same content. And it may be really tempting to then say, I'm just going to merge these into one sim single event. But by doing so, you need to look for a name of that event that loses the actual business intent of the event. In the short term, that sounds like a really great idea, but in the long, long term, you won't be able to properly explain your system anymore. And last but not least, um, diagnosing and issues is a lot harder. So if you think about a monolith, you have one deployable, you can have one place to look through the logs. It's all simple. There is no asynchronous communication over queues and whatnot. Um, so. It, it's simple, but in a, in, the, in a distributed system, it's exponentially harder. If you look back at all the services that we have, if getting to an understanding of where a specific document failed is, is quite difficult to uh, diagnose. How did, the, how did the document go through the system? So for us, it, or it's setting up the basic hygiene in terms of monitoring, logging, tracing is essential. You don't want to postpone that to a later stage. Um, if you then take it one step forward, uh, further, 
you really need to de de invest in dependency health checking and performance monitoring. So at a specific point, if you segregate by responsibilities, you will have, for example, a front end that calls multiple APIs. So you need to be able to, per API that you're exposing, um, communicate to the out outside world whether it's healthy, what kind of dependencies that that, does that service has. Does it depend on Postgres? Does it depend on, on Elasticsearch? Are they still healthy? So think about uh, degraded states, um, unhealthy statuses, and think about how that translates into the user experience that you're going to give to, uh, to your end user. I'm going to skip over this one for, for a bit. Um, Cross-cutting concerns, last is um, also, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we now have. So we have five services in Scala and four in Python, and they almost all need authentication, authorization, Kafka, uh, health checking, database connectivity, uh, reprocessing capabilities, and I can keep going. So at a certain point, you hit a boundary where you have more services than developers, and you need to think about how you can get your the, the infrastructure basically, so the plumbing. Where how can we get the plumbing out of those services and into a shared location? And there are um, concepts like a mono repo that you could use. And um, so this is uh, for us at least this is one of the most um, relevant problems that we currently face. All right. So I guess the gist of the story for it would be for me that any architecture comes with pros and cons. There is no right way. This could have this could have probably be three single services that communicated over HTTP would introduce simply a whole set of different problems. Um, what you do tend to see is that with the systems, the type of systems as shown here, the complexity shifts from the application level to the infrastructure level. So all of these common concepts you need to manage on an infrastructure level, you don't want to duplicate over multiple components, basically. Um, overall, I'm very happy with the flexibility that, that it gives us and the ability to scale to, um, scale to multiple document types, but also isolate failure um, and, and provide a really good user experience. Um, last but not least, if you're interested in working uh, with me on this product or similar products that we do at uh, WBA, please let me know because we are still hiring. Okay, thank you, Mark. That was a very nice presentation. Um, I can't hear you, focus. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, so uh, we will. Uh, yeah, we will. Please send any questions that you have to Mark, and then uh, Mark will get back to you. Uh, and we will we will move on to the next speaker.